with that. What we'll, we want to do is we want to hang out with Philip once he gets his voice and just kind of have a conversation with him. And we've got a bunch of questions. Check. I got totally it. Totally good. Yay. You rock. Yay. Everybody. That hey. is crazy painful. That was like pulling teeth painful. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I, uh, I guess my first thought is it's so inspiring. What a great community we've still got here, even with it. I mean, look at me. I'm the guy who created this thing, and it just took me an hour to get this working. It's a shorter time than driving to Burning Man, though. you got to admit that. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I love the drive to Burning Man. That's the best, one of the best parts of the experience for me. It is Especially true. going going from that. What's the name of that place where you turn off the main road to go out? That last little wonderful gas station where everybody fuels up. I come in from the north because we have to come down from Seattle, and that's a beautiful beautiful drive too. We we drove through the forest fires last year, and that was really strange. It's uh. Hey, thanks for coming, and thanks for working on that. I, I really appreciate um, the effort to get this thing working, though, and the sim crashing and such. But I guess the sim's looking pretty pretty stable right now. How are you doing? <laughs> That's a first. As well as I can be, as well as I can be in my virtual, my new virtual body here as Philip Rosedale, not Philip London. Yeah. Hey, are, are you going to be at Burning Man this year? I am. Awesome. We'd love to have you come by camp. We've got um, uh, a lot of interesting things that have happened. We've had a lot of people come in from Burning Man regionals. We're now an official um, regional on the Burning Man page. We show up as cyberspace uh, as a regional. And so there's been a lot of crossover, and we have a lot of people coming from Second Life to Burning Man this year. So we'd love to see you. Wow, that's great. Um, Very cool. Yeah, it is cool. So um, I'm gonna because you have 15 minutes. I wanted to to kind of jump over a bunch of questions, um, but we wanted to just ask you a little bit about about changes in virtual worlds and and, and what's going on. It's funny today, um, Pulse. There was a, an article uh, about a 1994 interview with Steve Jobs, and and he was quoted as saying, uh, "My work's going to be abs obsolete by 2005." And that, that's kind of the nature of us as technologists is we develop right. things and kind of eat our young. And we wanted to find out uh, what you've been up to lately. And can you tell us anything about this high-fidelity stuff? Well, not a whole lot, but I, I do. I, I mean, we are hard at work uh, on a bunch of uh, completely ground-up, brand-new ideas for, you know, how to build a virtual world. Um, uh, I do think things have changed a lot. If you say Steve said his work was going to be obsolete by 2005, I mean, I think that that, uh, that is very much the nature of technology nowadays. You know, we get, we get uh, you know, five years between uh, something that makes a lot of sense and something that's kind of hopelessly obsolete. I think Second Life has actually fared really well in that regard. You know, we launched Second Life in 2003, you know what I mean? Wow. And... Uh, I mean, think about that. And there have been a million, you know, there have been a lot of people online in Second Life every moment of every day. Uh, you know, what, six or seven, you know, eight years now. So pretty amazing. Yeah, getting a 10-year run is, is amazing for, for any type of, of platform or software product like that. It's, yeah. It's so rare. It's just so much um, fun to, to, to think about, you know, how to make this all better. I mean, I'm like I say, the... the you know, logging into a sim that can't handle more than 100 people, right? Like any sim, I mean, there's no, there's no virtual world technology on Earth right now that would let a general experience like this be experienced by more than 100 people. You know, that's that's one of the things that we're working on. Is uh, how about if I can make it 10,000 people? How about that? You know, or 100,000. Um, you you were interviewed and talked a little bit about kind of a SETI like computing. Uh, a collective computing solution. Uh, that yeah. sounds pretty Burning Man radically collaborative to me. <laughs> it sure does. Which is very that. much where my heart is. But, you know, there's a practical challenge. Well, so here's the thing. How many people are logged into Second Life right now, everybody? About 100,000, right? So, yeah. you know, there's somewhere between you know, 70 and 100,000 people logged in. I'm sure somebody out here has the exact number. But uh, if, 
if everybody, so, so the question is, how many of those people have an extra machine, you know, in their den, in their office that is idle? Everybody, right? In fact, I'd say the average for everybody is, you know, probably 1.8 or something like that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, four. So, so here's the thing. The, the other fact is, how much do we all use Second Life every day? I'll tell you the answer. It's about an hour, right? I mean, I'm sure everybody knows the number, but it's about an hour. So what that means is that if, if you've got an extra, you know, computer lying around and you use something like you use Second Life an hour a day, uh, if you wanted to throw that computer into a pool, you know, for some reason, and, and you wanted to use that to simulate the virtual world, well, what that means is that uh, uh, we'd have a ton of computers available to create the virtual world, maybe a million. You know, there's about a million people, for example, today that, you know, over, say, a month's time are, are logging into Second Life. So uh, that's pretty cool because the number of, if you use those computers on a server network, uh, like Amazon's EC2 or something like that, uh, a million computers, a million servers is very expensive. You know, to pull a million machines into service is, uh, is, is expensive. But, of course, like you said, why don't you just collaborate? Why don't we get everybody to share their computers, right? So, yeah, this is one of the things that we're working on trying to do. It's kind of like what it, I think uh, Roe called it crowdsourced computing power. <laughs> kind of... A funny term. So, so with all that, yeah. where's, where, where are virtual worlds going to be like in five years or, or ten years? I mean, what we're talking augmented reality or, or something like that. Where mobile computing is coming up? What's, what's going to happen? Well, let's talk about mobile computing for a second. I think what's important about mobile computing actually isn't, you know, the ability to connect to the Internet while you're on a bus. I think that's wonderful or, or connect to it through a very small device. What, what's interesting to us, and you, you guys have probably seen some of our little videos and stuff about what we've been doing. What's interesting to us is the fact that these mobile devices have these uh, gyros and other sensors in them that potentially allow you to drive to control your avatar with more degrees of freedom than a mouse gives you. So a mouse gives you two degrees of freedom, right? But uh, there are three degrees of freedom in gyros, and there are... Uh, you know, more than that in uh, the, the other sensors that are easy to deploy in a mobile device. So that's something that we are thinking about a lot right now. And personally, looking back on these last 10 years of Second Life, I think that the mouse, the sort of uh, slavery of the mouse, has been a tremendous kind of... Uh, unbreachable challenge that that you can only do so much it takes tremendous training to move and manipulate objects walk around fly around in a virtual world using only a mouse and a keyboard which is what we've all pretty much right we've pretty much all been stuck with so i think that if we can use uh, more sensors and more devices there's there's some magic that we can make happen with that and going back to your question about uh, virtual worlds in 10 years. I think one of the most amazing things about Second Life has been, and then look, and it's what happens, is what we're doing right now, which is we're sitting in a group and we all kind of feel like we're together. Like it's really amazing. It's nothing like being on a chat room, right? It's nothing like being, it's nothing like being on a phone call. It's not like being on a big you know, shared phone call, which I think for good reason have been largely unsuccessful. You know, they're when was the last time somebody here was on a big group phone call where they were excitedly talking about some new technology, right? Never. Yeah. yeah. And there's reasons for that. And and so I think Second Life, one of the things it's done that's just so inspiring, I mean, look at this, beyond the content itself, beyond the world itself, has been this ability to get 20 or 30 people sitting around together and, and talking to each other like we are. It's just incredible how you can do that so so we're sitting here thinking okay where how far can we take that like how, how 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 much can we all feel like we're sitting near each other and that's so that's that's a big part of what, we're, what are the important points that kind of push it to the next level for, for well, interaction I, I don't know i mean we're we're in a kind of a we're in a a research kind of a lab mode you know at linden lab we love i love the word lab you know we're we are wearing our lab coats right now, and we are uh, playing. We're trying a lot of different things. So I, I'm not sure exactly what the 
key points are that are going to take the level of immersion and the sense of presence higher than what we've got right now. But that's, uh, that's what we're working on. Very cool. So you've got a lot going on with virtual worlds. Is there, are you doing anything fun outside of virtual worlds? What, what else are you, are you doing that's kind of got you excited out there? Well, you know what I started doing in the last couple of years? I started boxing. I thought that wow. uh, I thought that I could have a, an amazing experience uh, uh, improving myself by trying something as as aggressive and high conflict as that. You know, I, for me at least, that was an experience I had never had, and that's been it's been great. I think it's made me a better person to uh, have a little bit of that a uh, little bit of that experience. So that, that's been a blast. I, I've really gotten into it. I've really been interested, actually, in how the same hardware that we're playing with here at High Fidelity can be used for things like sports. So Reebok last week, I think, announced something that we had literally sort of prototyped as I was doing this boxing stuff, which was the ability to put a little uh, accelerometer on your head, basically, and keep yourself safe when you're engaging in these sports like football or boxing where you get hit in the head, basically. Wow. There's technology that seems to be embedding just just everywhere, and it's it's kind of interesting with uh, uh, the way it's watching people and the way it's it's gathering information about people. Uh, we read about the ability with a camera to detect heart rate and things like that. Um, where does yeah. does it where, where's the line where it starts? Does it ever become too intrusive? For, for people. That's a great question. I've really been thinking about that. Like, if we build a next generation virtual reality system which is what we're working on here and I could show you guys your heart rate would you want to show that to everybody would you <laughs> would you let somebody walk up to you and see your heart beating how about your eyes moving um, uh, how about your fingertips you know th these are the things that we're thinking about you know what what yeah I, I agree I think it's a fascinating design question what's how much is too much where's the line where we sort of all want to meet each other in virtual yeah. spaces I mean, the, 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 you can take the David Brin approach, which is, well, if everybody knows everything, then it's a level playing field. It's where it becomes unlevel that you hit, that you, you know, you start wondering about what's going on. They know more about me than I know about them, kind of. I'm a big fan of that fact. I think the whole uh, big uh, NSA uh, wiretapping debates of the last few weeks have been fascinating in that regard. I, I would reiterate that a world in which uh, a lot of people have a lot of information about a lot of things and about each other, even if it's uncomfortable, is is broadly a good world and I think that the world in which one person has a lot more information about what everybody's doing is of course a very dangerous and unappealing world so I, I think but but I think that if you're forced to choose between transparency and obscurity uh, I think the former is a more compelling road to the future yeah Matt, absolutely it's 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 kind of funny as you, you look at the ten principles of Burning Man and, and radical self-expression is and, and the combination of gifting is, here's all the information about me. That's my self-expression. You, you may know me this way. Um, that's how I, I participate, is providing not only the information, but the, the work that I, I go and do out there. Um, we're, we're pretty excited here on the, on the sim. We uh, um, had 10 artists come in and do builds based on each one of the 10 principles here. And they did some amazing work. And um, this is... Uh, part of the celebration of, t of 10 years here in, in Second Life. And one of the questions that Holocluck uh, wanted, or excuse me, Haplo wanted to ask um, was what's kind of changed um, since uh, in, in these 10 years from the time when you, you first launched the lab and then launched Second Life to, to now? Um, is, there, is there any outlook that's changed or viewpoint that's changed or greater understanding that you have? Let's pick an area, and I'll touch on each one. I mean, I think culturally, and, and I think culturally, like, like look at the Internet as a community, a lot has changed. I think that some of the founding ideas that we explored in Second Life from, you know, 2003 on, that of uh, a high degree of transparency, a comfort with an assumed identity that's not necessarily yourself but is pervasive and real and information rich and has a lot of transparency like we've just been talking about you know the 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 willingness to sort of treat the internet that way and to uh, create accounts and identities within it that's changed a lot since second life started and we were way ahead you know, we as a community were way ahead in, in embracing that so so I think that's that's interesting um, when you look at technology 
technology, a lot has changed as well. Uh, the latencies, the, the time delay from one point to another has dropped a lot. That's one of the things that I'm really excited about with our new work. The, the time it takes for a packet to get from the East Coast to the West Coast, for example, has dropped a lot, and it's approaching the speed of light, and it's down at a, it's down at a speed where we can't really sense it anymore, which is pretty... That's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's part of what's driving our work here. Another one is, as I said, all of these interface devices that have just come up like it feels like some sort of Cambrian explosion in the last year. You know, from the Oculus to the, to the, to the Leap to the, you know, to, to just the basic gyros that are in our phones to, uh, to the Kinect to, you know, to the variant uh, versions of the Kinect. You know, there's a million different depth cameras out there now. All of that stuff just showed up in the last few years. And ten years ago, you couldn't possibly have considered uh, having access, ha having any kind of broad, broad access to technology like that. So that that's been, a, I've been that's been just inspiring to me as an. I, I was at the Maker Fair in Seattle, um, and I stood in front of a, a wall of uh, connects, and it um, it mapped me. Um, build a mesh for my body, uh, applied a texture of the image of my of me, and it was probably five seconds to do it. If that, it was just uh, so challenging to think how that how that moves forward. There's almost a kind of a there's almost two worlds. You know, there's the world of scanning reality, and then there's the world of recreating it as we do here. You know, and you're willing to take the time to build it from the ground up, like we do here. You get to this level of. Uh, uh, detail and emotionality and you know just everything impact that is so much better so it's fascinating very good um, i want to be time sensitive to you do you have time to for a few questions from our, our from people here that they can type yeah, yeah absolutely we can go until awesome. like eleven thirty. it's great great hey um guys uh if you could go and uh, type a question mark if you have a question and then we'll call on you okay thank you um I, I have, my question basically deals with what most people consider the double-edged sword of a medium like Second Life. There's people who would argue that Second Life, uh, because people are getting involved online and there, there's that lack of social interaction on, you know, the realistic level. Whereas people believe that a medium like Second Life has really succeeded in actually bringing more people together. So there's that people have different opinions on, you know, the good and bad of it. So what would your opinion be on that whole subject? I think it's an easy answer, although it's a good debate. But I think the debate is over. I mean, uh, over the last few years, I think what we've seen, not just in Second Life, but in other spaces, is that even if you don't have a tremendous amount of real-time bandwidth between you, you know, even if you're typing in text, the slow process of learning about each other still happens. So, so I, for myself, I've seen, I've met many people who met in Second Life and got married or started dating or whatever, and I've been there with them in the real world, not necessarily when they've met, but I've gotten a chance to, you know, meet them face-to-face -face afterwards or meet one of them and talk about the experience. And I've honestly uh, never seen a case where I felt that people that had met in the virtual world were any less uh, aware of each other or, you know, knowing knowing what they were getting into or connected in the real world than normal people that met in the real world. So I, I think it's a worthy debate, but the, the, the uh, empirical evidence at this point is overwhelmingly in favor of the fact that uh, if you take the time to get to know each other in Second Life when you it's real, you know, you really are learning about each other, and when you walk up to each other in real life, uh, you really do know each other. Now, I think there's a certain magic to how that happens that nobody really understands. Yeah, Arabella just said, think pen friends. I think that's exactly right. Like, it just takes a lot longer. If it, It's like pushing, you know, yourself through a tiny little drinking straw. You can do it. You can do it. You know, you can squeeze yourself through it. It's just going to take a while. So one of the things I'm excited about is just how can we speed that up? How can we speed that up? How can we open the channel up wider so that, you know, you can, you can uh, become, you know, uh, come to understand someone faster? But I think that, uh, I think that uh, there's no question but that virtual worlds bring people together uh, in, a, in a good way. There's just no question. I, wouldn't, I, I am as inspired to work on this. I'm more inspired. I mean, I'm as inspired to work on this today uh, as I was when I was, you know, 24 and just thinking about the possibilities. So 
there's, there's no question. I, I just want to see virtual worlds get bigger and have more and more impact, you know, which is why I'm working on high fidelity. Awesome. Um, Ice Guy just wrote, um, do you... Here we potential conflict between individual transparency and the ability to identify with an alternate image oneself. No, I actually don't. I think that's a good question. So the question there is, is there a conflict between being transparent and then not being yourself online? I, I think what's emerging is that your online identity, your stable online identity, that is to say, you know, MC, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the the name that you have in the virtual world becomes such a rich carrier of data and such a source of responsibility and you know seriousness uh, that it 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 serves as a reasonable proxy for you know the human body and, and form. I don't I don't think we need I don't think we need to be uh, transparent about who we are in the real world to have the benefits of. The virtual world work. That said, I think that we need, we're still in the early days of this. So for example, I need an easy way to walk up to somebody and privately say to them, hey, uh, well, but by the way, like for you guys right now, how do you know I'm really Philip Rosedale? <laughs> you can ask yourself. You'll note that my avatar is a different avatar name because I changed that because I'm, you know, officially working on high fidelity now and, uh, and no longer uh, officially a, a part of Linden Lab. And so, as is the way we do it at Linden Lab, I, I have I now have my my real name back. Um, but how do you know I'm really Philip Rosedale? So one one of the things we need in virtual worlds is an ability for me to perhaps privately uh, slip you something, you know, hand you something, you know, virtually that proves who I am. So I think mechanisms like that that are then opt-in mechanisms that you don't have to use all the time are going to be just fine. And I think for the cases where you choose to have a, a virtual identity that is completely divorced from uh, who you are in reality, I think that'll be fine as well, although you can expect, and we've already seen this in Second Life and Virtual Worlds, uh, you can expect that people are going to, you know, judge you as an avatar and decide whether they want to be friends with you or work with you or whatever, and yeah, you know, that's exactly how it should be. One of the most uh, distressing things was having to go and uh, change my playa name from MC uh, when I picked up a, a Black Rock Ranger handle, so I'm Black Rock Ranger Diver Dave, and uh, some people know me as both MC, and some people know me as Diver Dave, and some people know me as David McLean, my real name. It gets confusing out there. We always laughed at work at Linden when I was working at Linden. We would laugh that we we all had so many names. I mean, not to, my God, not to mention the burners that worked at Linden Lab, you know. We, we had so many different names, our, our given physical name, our, our second life name, our, our uh, you know, it was just, it was totally nuts. We, we chuckle about it in the office a lot. It gets confusing. Oh, Chimera, you had a question. You're next. Um, you want it in voice? Sure, sure. sure. Go for it. Um, I was just asking about avatars. Uh, the new avatar, Philip knows this. <laughs> looks a little round and clunky, so I just wonder if he has pictures of us getting customizable avatars in his new world. No, I'm not. We're, 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 we're playing with ideas there, but I don't have any, uh, I don't have any update for you. Like I say, it's still really early. We're, uh, we're really going back to the roots and building everything from zero, so we're, uh, we're completely rethinking uh, everything okay, okay. about okay. the world, okay. the atoms. So. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You gotta have shoes. I'm gonna take that. Uh, I'm gonna take that quote to my team here at lunchtime. We have a Friday lunch together, and I'm gonna. That'll be our quote for the lunch: is you gotta have shoes. Cool. Do we have time for one more question from Danger? We can take a couple more. This is great. Danger, hey, go. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how uh, your. Um, your distributed computing idea is will compare to what's going on in the open source grids. I assume you know about open source grids, and and in there we use computers to run our own regions. Is that going to be comparable to your new idea? I think in a lot of ways, yes. I, I believe that a kind of an open, uh, uh, well, the two different issues, but both open source and open open platform and open API version of virtual worlds is, is definitely where we're all going. And, you know, the open source grids have been a great proof of that concept. Uh, uh, 
I think, though, that there's potentially even more clever work that needs to be done around dynamic allocation of computing resources. One of the problems we have right here, right now, we just experienced it when I was trying to get here, is this problem with uh, we can have 100 people sitting here in all their avatar glory uh, talking to me, listening to me, but we can't have 1,000 or 10,000. Uh, the allocation scheme that's used for the open source sims, which is quite similar to Second Life, also won't allow 1,000 or 10,000. Um, there isn't a way to dynamically uh, scale the uh, audience size. And uh, the, the, so there are ways to do that, and that's one of the things that we're working hard on. So uh, at, a, at a basic level, absolutely. Um, I think that the distributed computing model that is uh, demonstrated by the open source grids is definitely the kind of model that one needs to have a really big system. But we have additional challenges around uh, the kind of, uh, you know, huge number of people showing up in one place and how you conceptually handle that. And the, the fixed tiling that we did in Second Life uh, and is also emulated in the open source grids is not uh, going to solve that. Uh, it's not, not yet. It, it doesn't in its current form solve that scaling problem. Thanks, Danger, for the question. All right. Any more questions out there? More before I take off here. This is great. No. Wow. Everybody's sitting there going, I think we've just blown everybody's brains. <laughs> hey, Arabella, with your paw, what's the last question? There's the... My answer's Grease. <laughs> I'm not there anymore. It's a great. It's great to be with everybody here as well. I'm wait. We're waiting for Arabella's last question. There you go. 2023. You know what? Uh, what do you see yourself doing in 2023? Um, I can say with confidence that I don't know. You know, 13 years from now. I'm sorry, 10 years from now, the way things are going, the way technology is evolving right now. Uh, yeah, and I and I think that that. I think 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, my gosh, we're going to continue to have this geometric acceleration in technology. Uh, we're going to see things that we never could imagine, you know, even even as exciting as things were 10 years ago. I think that is absolutely 100 percent true. Um, and if you carry that, uh, if you carry that continued growth out and you look at how much is happening today in technology, I think the exciting thing about 2023 is I don't have any idea what things are going to look like. I do think that I'll be working, I'll tell you, I do think that I'll be working on uh, virtual worlds and virtual communication. I think that that is a big problem that will continue to absorb my time and lots of other people's time for quite some time. I don't think that uh, we will be uh, in some, uh, I, I don't think that we will necessarily, even in 10 years, have the, you know, perfect immersive virtual world experience that is sort of from a technical standpoint finished. Uh, and, and so if that's true, I bet you that I will still be working on it <laughs> if I'm around. Uh, and I think I, I think and hope I will be. So uh, that's a great uh, that's a great final question. So I mean, in short, uh, yeah, I, I plan to keep working on this stuff uh, just on and on and on. I, I you know, it, it I just look at how exciting, uh, look at everybody sitting here, and, you know, it just brings such a smile to my face, not having been in world for a while, uh, to, to see, you know, kind of what the end goal is, to be reminded that the end goal is just to, to have an experience like we're having here and then take it farther and farther and farther. You know, why can't there be the 50,000 people that will be out there in the desert this year? Why can't they all be kind of wandering around just outside of center camp here like they are when you're really at Burning Man? Why can't we make that work? Uh, why can't I walk up to – why can't I go walk up to the – one of these uh, exhibits out here and, and wander up to somebody and look them in the face and feel like I'm standing right there. You know, why can't I do that? I think we can. So I'm just so excited to see what that's going to look like. And, you know, just like I was with Second Life, you know, to be there on day one and, you know, day 1,000 and, and, you know, have a feel for it. Um, well, we, we appreciate you creating, creating this space so that we could all come together and discover each other and become friends and become burners together here from all over the globe because it's been very special in our friendships here and the things that we do and the art that we bring and the things that we celebrate are absolutely a big, a big part of our lives so thank you very much thanks everybody and i do look forward to seeing you out there in the desert mc because i will i will be out there this year it's going to be fun you know dustin's right. got the best bar on, on the entire playa so. <laughs>
been there before, and I'll be going back this year. <laughs> I'll, oh, I'll see you out there, Dusty. All right, you guys. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, Philip. Bye. Okay. Awesome. Yay well, for technical difficulties yay. being overcome, huh? You know, that's second life. It was a great second